Good morning, men. One of the benefits of traveling is that you get to have stories about the lack of benefits of traveling. <laughs> Went through the Shreveport, Louisiana airport a couple of weeks ago. Wow, I already have a few chuckles. It was the most fascinating experience because the woman who checked my ID looked at the ID, looked at me, looked again at the ID, looked again at me, and then looked again at the ID, and then told me the date that my driver's license expired. <laughs> there was a man helping us put things onto the security assembly line there before x-ray, and he asked me, are you carrying any hazardous substances? I said, no, sir. He said, are you carrying any weapons? And I thought, well, if I was, I sure wouldn't tell you. <laughs> and he asked me a battery of questions, and then he turned to my wife, my sweet wife, and asked her if she had any weapons or drugs. You know. I couldn't believe this. And then so we go through the machine, and uh, you have to remove, like, Everything, uh, you know, if, that's not cloth. And then they tagged my wife. And so <laughs> they took my wife off to this location. And I've been tagged before. And, you know, I've had them go through my stuff. But they, this woman went through every item in my wife's purse, went through every item in my wife's cosmetic case, and every other item, and, and felt around in the cloth items to see, I guess, if there was something hard in there or something. I'm not sure what was going on. And finally, I couldn't take it. I said, wow. I said, this is amazing to this woman. I said, is this like a Shreveport? Is this some, like, big military installation here or something? I mean, is this like a, a drug trafficking drop-off point or something? You know, what, what is so important about Shreveport that the, 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 you have such top security measures? And she says, oh, I, really, to tell you the truth, we just don't have that much traffic, and so we don't have that much else to do. <laughs> so I guess everything can be important if you have all the time in the world. But most people don't have all the time in the world. Another story, I was going through Orlando, heading out, and I got tagged. And so the, the fellow took the little swatch, and he, you know, he rubbed it on all different areas of my case. And I said, you know, I, I guess I should have asked this years ago, but uh, why do you do that? And he said, oh, well, we're testing for explosives. And I said, well, I always thought that you used that to test for drugs. He said, well, we used to, but we don't care about that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and so they're, they, they're very busy at Orlando Airport, and so they have to prioritize between what's important and what's not important. So, so it's okay if you have drugs, just don't have weapons or explosives, I guess it is. Well, that fits pretty well to what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about priorities. We're going to talk about what are the most desirable priorities for me as a believer in business. And we'll talk about first what uh, are priorities and why, why do they matter, why are they important. Then we'll focus on some ideas from Jesus. And then we will think through some, some of our work, work priorities. So, you know, how do we decide what's important? Well, first we'll talk about uh, what priorities are and why they're important. I put a bunch of things at the bottom of your questions. Uh, it should say, you know, what are they and why important. Basically, a priority is something to which we assign some degree of importance or urgency. If you go over to the Home Depot <clears throat> and you don't know what you want before you get there, 
uh, as I have done, you're likely to come home with a number of tools that after 10 years you have still never used. So uh, it's, the, the idea is, is that among the universe of things you can do, there are some things that you want to do that really are the most important things to you. And so we want to today focus in on that with regard to uh, being a believer in business. So to prioritize means to arrange in some order. You know, when you say I'm going to prioritize my work or I'm going to prioritize my to-do list, what do you mean? You mean that you're going to arrange your work in the order of its importance. Yes, this is what it means to prioritize. So there are some other thoughts on there that you can, can look at. And uh, the reason that having priorities in, in business or anyplace else is so important because if I don't decide what's important for me, other people will. So this is the whole idea of, of focusing, setting priorities, and uh, trying to get it right. So that's what priorities are, and, uh, and a little bit about why they matter. The big idea for today uh, is this, the question, one of the most desirable priorities for me as a believer, the big idea today, <clears throat> the big idea today is this. My priorities as a Christian, are motivated by an altogether different reason for living. My priorities are motivated by an altogether different reason for living. This was brought home very clearly to me earlier this week. I had a meeting, a business meeting, and uh, the other two people in the meeting incredibly moral, honest, upright, ethical people, good people, but they have a ceiling on their reason for living. Their reason for living is, well, it just has a ceiling. It's to make a living. It's to make money. It's to be personally fulfilled. It's Maslow's hierarchy of needs. That's what it is. Without Christ, you're limited. The highest you can get in your reason for living is the top of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And so these two people had an altogether different reason for being at that meeting than I did. Now, we were pursuing the same deal, but for different reasons. The big idea this morning, my priorities, what's important to me, is going to be motivated by an altogether different reason for living. And let's take a look at some focusing ideas on this from Jesus. I want us to start at John 10, verse 10. Jesus writes, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. John 10, 10. We'll look at a number of verses here that are very familiar to, to many of us. They deal with <clears throat> uh, kind of a tapestry of things that Jesus and other biblical writers have said about why we live, why we exist, what a reason for, for living is. <clears throat> Reading on in John 10, 10, Jesus says this. He says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. My reason for living is the abundant life. So when, when I'm in a business meeting, the reason that I'm there is to participate in the abundant life. It's to, to give and to serve. It's to, it's to receive God's blessings, but it's, it's to serve. It's to bring glory to God by my actions. It's I know that there's something going on in the cosmos that's much, uh, that there are greater things going on in that meeting. I know that God is working out all things for his own glory. I know that he's working everything together for good in that meeting. I know that the sovereign, supreme ruler of all creation is interested in the outcome of that meeting. You don't have that if you don't have God. God. 
if your reason for living is to make a profit, <laughs> do you, I mean, do you see just how utterly different these two worldviews are? Just how utterly, I'm not going to say that that other one is, is bankrupt. It's just that it's, it's just that it's so puny. It's just that it's so anemic. It's just that it's so tepid. It's like, it's like a weenie reason for living. It's like a, it just doesn't make any, once you have known the glories and the riches of, of the kingdom of God, how could you ever be willing to settle for merely profit? I mean, that would make no sense whatsoever. There's so much more to life. There's such greater reason to live. It's the abundant life. I came, Jesus said, to give you life and to give it to you in the full, the abundant life. Now, if you would, let's flip over to Matthew 6.33, or flip back to Matthew 6.33. I referenced 6.34 yesterday, uh, last time, about not worrying about tomorrow, the verse before it. Um, I, I'm going to guess that probably a third of you have this verse memorized. Probably 10% of it, us have this as our life verse. It's a very, very familiar and popular text from Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. 6.33, Jesus says, after telling us not to worry, he says, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Everything, everything you want. So we have a higher reason for living. It's to seek his kingdom. It's to seek his, his righteousness. Now, one thing that's very interesting to me in business <clears throat> is business rewards people for, for living by Christian values. Business is not really about pursuing non-Christian things. Actually... Business is all about pursuing Christian values. Integrity, diligence, excellence, honesty, uh, humility. These, these character traits, if you will, or qualities, these are, these are prizes, and they are rewarded generously. But for the Christian, they're done for an altogether different reason. For the non-Christian, they're means to an end. The non-Christian uses his excellence to get money. The non-Christian uses humili his humility to hide his pride. <laughs> the non-Christian uses integrity to, to get what he wants. The non-Christian uses compassion towards people in order to work people to get them to be high-performing employees. The Christian does these things for an altogether reason. For the Christian, these character quality traits are not merely means to other ends. They are ends in themselves. For the Christian, they're part of his reason for living. It's because he is seeking first God's kingdom and his righteousness. And this is, this is the, the way he demonstrates his righteousness. Okay, let's, let's go to another one. John chapter 15, verse 8. John chapter 15, verse 8. The very first question in the shorter catechism of the Westminster Confession, by the way, this week I sent an email to a few people that I, mostly whom I was in uh, people I was in contact with anyway, who are Christians, and I said, I said, tell me, what are the most desirable priorities for you as a believer in business? And one of them came back and said, well, gosh, I mean, there's so many things. I guess it's just basically the Westminster Confession. And yeah, but I mean, nobody can handle. The, the, the reason you have to have priorities as a human man is because we're finite. God does not have to set priorities. Have you ever thought about that? 
he does not have to decide what's important and what's not important among all the things that, that are on his list because he's infinite. So he can be simultaneously invested in, in everything. You and I can't because we're finite men. And so we have to take uh, this big list and say, well, we've got 168 hours and we're going to sleep uh, all but 112 of them. And so we're going to have, and we're going to only work half of those. So we're going to be about 55, 56 hours of, of dedication to work. And so how do we decide what's on our list? That prioritized list, the things that we think are important. And so <clears throat> we're looking at these focusing ideas from Jesus and uh, it's, it's reflecting his righteousness. And then in John 15, 8, where you are now, Jesus again, he says this, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit. So we want to be productive. We want to bear much fruit. But why do we want to do that? Because my, the overarching purpose of our lives, one way of saying it, is to bring glory to God. You know, it's great that we're interested in poor people. It's great that we're interested in unwed mothers. It's great that we're interested in prisoners. But the reason that we're interested is because by executing on that interest, we are bringing glory to God. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit. Why? Showing yourselves to be what? My disciples. When we, when we do bear fruit... We bring glory to God because we show people that we are his disciples, that there's something different about us. These are some focusing ideas from Jesus, looking at how Jesus actually set his own priorities. Turn with me to Luke chapter 4, and this is the text that's on the outline today. I guess turn back to Luke chapter 4, verse 42. I can always tell when Jim Seibert's watch alarm is going off because he never turns it off when it goes off. Isn't it interesting, you know, why would you set an alarm on your watch to go off when you... You're tone deaf to that particular ring anyway, and so you don't even hear it. So he's been doing that for 10 years, and he's never heard it once. He doesn't even know it's set. <laughs> yeah, he's right. Luke 4.42, <clears throat> it says, at, at daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. The people were looking for him, and when they came to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving. But Jesus said, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent. In other words, he knew his purpose. He knew why he was there. He knew his reason for being in the meeting. He knew his calling. And so Jesus made his decisions on the basis of his priorities, not his pressures. These people were trying to pressure Jesus to do something that was different than he had been called to do. So the, one reason we set priorities, we see J Jesus setting priorities so that we are making our decisions based on those things that are important to us rather than the pressures. And it says in verse 44, and he did exactly that. He kept on preaching in the synagogues in Judea. <clears throat> well, there are many more <clears throat> big picture texts like this, this that we could look at. The point is, though, that my priorities are to be motivated by an altogether different reason for living. An altogether different reason for living. Let's take a look at the third piece of this today, and, and uh, let's think through together some 
uh, work priorities. Now, you have been given a sheet of paper. And I'd like maybe if everybody could put your hand on that, doing business God's way, the first 10 messages, titles, and the big ideas. <clears throat> well, I usually wouldn't mention this because I do it probably every 10th time, but this is so radical this morning, I'll mention it. Um, it's not unusual for me every now and then to completely rewrite a message, redo a message, uh, the morning of. In other words, I spend all week getting ready to go one direction, and then the Lord just says, no, I want you to go this direction. And so that's what happened this morning. <clears throat> and uh, uh, I believe that God gave me an epiphany this morning, and he said, well, Pat, if you're going to talk about uh, work priorities, uh, then um, what, what was happening was, as I was starting to feel like, you know, this message is getting awfully complicated. <laughs> and then the Lord reminded me, he said, you know, you've just taught through uh, 10 very important potential priorities. Why don't you just review those with the guys? <laughs> and so I, I went to the list. And I pulled it down, and I couldn't believe it. I mean, <clears throat> here you have 10 priorities for business. Uh, some of you may be more drawn to uh, different, uh, you'll be drawn to different areas, obviously. But I think th this is a good list to work from. And so let's just kind of work through it together. Okay, so the first one, and this may be too small to read on the screen, that's why I printed it out. <clears throat> Is, is calling. Can business be a calling just like going into the ministry? The big idea for that first message was businessman or minister, same thing. Bob Buford is one of the people that I was communicating with this week about... <clears throat> One of the most desirable priorities for a believer in business. And uh, Bob actually sent me his life goals from 1988 when he was 48 years of age. So Bob is, what, then 69 years of age right now. <clears throat> and his very first... So he has five goals that he wrote out. The very first one is to walk worthy of my calling. To walk worthy of my calling. And then he had some sub points. To have a primary, primary loyalty to Jesus Christ. <clears throat> I'll read a couple of other goals that he had. To make one person happy. Linda, his wife. Isn't that interesting? And then he has, uh, his third goal is the 21-year plan. So he just mapped out here a 21-year plan for what he wanted to happen as a, a believer in business. Businessman or minister, same thing. Any of you who have ever read about Bob Buford know that as a businessman, he's had a profound impact on the way people think about their lives as believers in business. For him, being a businessman was the same thing as being a minister. And really, it's the same for all of us. And, and this might be an area that some of you would like to focus more and <clears throat> make this uh, a priority, the idea of living as a called man. This next one is purpose. <clears throat> What are God's purposes for me in the marketplace? The big idea, you're in charge until I get back. <clears throat> Kim Loptrup is the president of Red Lobster here in town, <clears throat> headquartered here in town. So here's his answer. He gave Matthew 6, 33, seek first his kingdom and righteousness. And, and Kim wrote, in light of the above, the top priority in business, as in other parts of life, is to serve God faithfully. Uh, you're in charge until I get back. 
Uh, to me, that means, number one, doing the work that God has called me to do. Number two, being a faithful steward of the resources that have been entrusted to me. Number three, having a positive impact on customers, employees, and other communities. It should not mean letting business interfere with even more important obligations. Business should be a means to an end, not an end in itself. So uh, he has made faithfulness or this idea of being in charge until uh, God gets back. His kind of overarching priority. Third, integrity. To what standard should I hold myself and uh, what should I do when I fail? And we said the big idea that week was the Ten Commandments and the Golden Rule. Jeff McWaters, <clears throat> another man I spoke to this week, a former board member of Man in the Mirror and a friend from church from many years ago, has uh, 2,600 employees. He started an insurance company. He's up in Virginia. And uh, he said that these are his two uh, priorities as a believer in business. Number one, my kids would know that in business, I am a man who is just as trustworthy there as at home. Number two, that in my business career, I would never be asked to do something unethical because people know I would never even consider it. Isn't that interesting? He does it. He wants to. He wants to live his life. Integrity is the priority that Jeff has uh, highlighted here, and uh, he wants integrity to so ooze out of his pores that you wouldn't even consider asking him to do something that lacked integrity. Fourth priority is witnessing limits and possibilities in the marketplace. We talked about loud actions, quiet voice. A man who is a, a ranking executive down at Disney said this. His fourth priority was be intentional about sharing your faith and showing a real interest in the lives of those around you. See, the poor non-believer is, is stuck feigning an interest in those around them. But the Christian, um, I, I'm not, I, I, you know, that's overstating the case to make the point. I'm not saying that, that non-believers don't have real interest in other people. They do. I mean, non-believers love their children just like believers love their children. But there's, there's a dimension that is missing. There is a dimension. Because... Because the non-Christian is stuck in the rut of seeing you as a means to other ends, their interest in you can never be the same as the Christian who not only is, sees you as a way to do business, but also sees you as a child of God, someone who's been created in the image of God himself, and that that I see dignity and worth in you as a human being just because I know God made you. That's a, that's a very different way of looking at people. So the priority of witnessing. And then uh, performance. How can I balance the need to perform with the command to serve others? The big idea was a question. You know, what is my duty to Jesus Christ in performing with regard to wealth, what does God say about making money, profit, success, and charity? The big idea that money is a wonderful servant, but a ruthless master. So when making priorities, something to keep in mind. Bob Buford said something about that. I've got so many papers up here, I have no idea where Bob is anymore, though. And then uh, prayer. Is it okay to pray for business success? The big idea to not pray for success is to dishonor him. And so for some Christians, prayer would be a priority. I know that for me, personally, prayer is one of my priorities in business. I want to be a man who prays about everything, regardless. Uh, and you know, I just had an odd experience, too, this week. <laughs> um, 
I had a meeting where the stakes were really big, and I prayed about it, and then I needed to find a parking place at the airport, which is really a, a little thing, but I prayed about that too, you know. And I noticed something very interesting. I noticed that it seemed as though I had more ability to believe God that would give that God would give me the parking space than that God would give me the deal. And I said, something's wrong here. <laughs> but on examination, guess what I discovered? That, that I was confusing feelings and faith. Because the stakes were so much higher in the deal, the feelings, the fear of loss, the anxiety, the dread of losing that, that deal uh, created feelings, created anxiety. Whereas I knew that if I didn't get a parking space, I could go to another level and I'd still make my plane. And so there, there wasn't any fear or anxiety or dread associated with that. But it had nothing to do with faith. And, and when you are worried about a deal, uh, it... Don't make the mistake of confusing that with a lack of faith. Pray about it in faith, believing that the sovereign God of all creation will do, as we said last week, our plans are in the protection of his plans. And that he will do what is good and right. And then, eighth priority uh, to think for, about is uh, leadership. What does the Bible say that can strengthen and empower my leadership. Hot fire makes good steel. Jack Alexander from the Geronimo Fund, or whatever it is, Geronimo, Geronimo Investment Corp. Um, he's the CEO of that company. And so Jack wrote me back this week, and he said that um, he... Their lead client, their, by far their biggest client, um, the staff of his largest client were mistreating his employees badly, badly. And so he made an appointment with the executive team for his largest client, and he said to them, he said, you know, you are by far our largest client. But your people are going to have to stop mistreating my people or we're going to drop you as a client. He said, well, that spread through that company like wildfire because he took leadership. Because being a leader uh, it was such a priority for him. It was so important for him to stick up for his people. So hot fire makes good steel. Leadership. To, to be a leader for Christ as a priority. And then nine... People. What should be different about the way we treat people? I can be a man of grace or what? A man of what? All right. <laughs> Someone um, at our office, their spouse had uh, back surgery this week. Back surgery. Job related injury. A few vertebrae fused together, little titanium uh, rod box built around it to protect it in the future. And so I emailed the person who works with us yesterday. I said, can I have your, you know, your husband's um, number at the hospital? And it was interesting. She wrote back and she said, I'm just so blown away. I'm just, I'm so overwhelmed that you would want to talk to me. Do you know that He's worked for this other company, I think it was like 13 years or something. Do you know that not one person from that company has expressed any interest in my husband whatsoever? Because non-Christians are working for an altogether different reason. Uh, my priorities are based on an altogether different reason for living because when, when I think of people... I think of someone created in the image of God. When the non-Christian thinks of a person, they have to think of someone who's going to be returning to dust in not too many years. And then 
tenth planning, you know, what advice does the Bible offer about, wow, this is running over. Eh, sorry about that. Uh, might as well do the last one, though. What advice does the Bible offer about making plans? Our plans are under the protection of his plans. We said this last week. Oz Hillman, some of you know him. He has this TGIF daily devotional, and he's an author. Um, Oz um, sent me back an article in his response to this. He said this. Uh, there was an attorney from Nigeria that told him this story. This attorney had an occasion to appear and argue a case before the Supreme Court of his country. Just before the court hearing, he assembled his staff and his wife in the, the chambers, and they prayed about the case. And he said, God told me not to argue points one through four of my complaint. I had five points, I'm not, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm probably saying this wrong, but I had five points to argue in my case, and God said, only argue the fifth point. Only argue the fifth point. So this Nigerian lawyer, he just, he just obeyed God. And so when the Supreme Court was convened, he approached the judge, he says, Your, Your Honor, I would like to amend my plea and drop the first four counts, and I would only like to argue the fifth count. Well, the judge was shocked, but, but granted permission. And so then the lawyer proceeded to argue the fifth count and then sat down. Well, the other attorney got up and for 12 minutes could not complete a sentence. And finally, in utter frustration, he approached the bench and he says, Your Honor, it's, it's unfortunate that my colleague and friend has decided not to argue these first four points. I am forced to yield my case. And so he won the case because as it later came out, the other lawyer had prepared a defense or prepared a response for the first four counts, but had not re prepared a response for the fifth count. So he had nothing to say. That's allowing the Holy Spirit of God to invade your business. Our plans are under the protection of his plan. So which of these priorities do you need to make more important? You be the judge. But anyway, the big idea, regardless, is that my priorities are going to be, must be, should be, will be, let them be, Lord, always motivated by an altogether different reason for living. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are, you are awesome. And Lord, thank you so much that we don't have a ceiling, that our thoughts can range all the way to the outer reaches of the cosmos and even beyond into the Holy of Holies. And that we can bring you with us into our meetings. We can pray in your spirit. If, let prayer be a priority. Let your spirit lead us uh, to make plans by seeking your counsel, your wisdom. Lord, that, that we can set our priorities uh, differently, because we do have this altogether different reason for living. We ask your blessing on our own priorities, and we ask it in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.